Good morning, Calvary. My name is Thomas, if we've never had the opportunity to meet, and I'm on staff at the church, and it's my joy to be able to open up the scriptures on the weekends. And we're going to conclude a short series that we entitled Flourish, Love Like Jesus. Because we know that we have been made from relationship, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And in the Genesis story, God said, let us make man, humanity, men and women in our image, in our likeness. And so men and women were image bearers of a community. They were made from community and they were made for community, for relationship. First and foremost with our maker and then one another. In the Genesis story, God has made all things and Adam was in the garden and everything was said to be good except that Adam was alone, isolated. And we see that God makes a companion for him to remedy what was not good to be good. And one of the relationships we see from that is marriage. And we spent time looking at marriage and we see family. That's an integral part of our relationships. But many of us are single, single in our youth, single in the mid midlife. We were married and we're single again. And all of us, whether we're married, parents or kids or single, we are made to be in relationship. We flourish with relationships. And in isolation and loneliness, our health dwindles. And this is not something that I would say is unique from Thomas. This is actually what more and more studies show. Those in the social sciences show that isolation and loneliness is actually a detriment to our health. There was a massive research that was presented to Congress last year by the Surgeon General of the United States expressing a public health concern or crisis of isolation and loneliness in America today. And the Surgeon General presented before Congress his findings that though we are more connected than ever on many digital platforms, connected to one another on social networks, connected globally, there is an increased feeling of isolation and loneliness. And so there is a disparity from being connected to one another and what we would see being engaged in each other's lives. And what he presented before Congress is his plan to rebuild what he calls the social fabric of our society for what was once just taken for granted, that we were part of a community, engaged in community, has gone. And many people now are feeling isolated and alone. What was interesting about, if you read his report, was that faith community was mentioned as one of the things that kept social fabric together in the past, but wasn't necessarily a primary recommendation for how we're going to fix this going forward. And I find that fascinating because there's another study that I want to bring your attention to. This is done by Harvard. Back in 2016, Harvard has this program of human flourishing. And they looked at what are the four pathways that people need in their life to flourish. Now remember, this is a secular university. They looked at all the empirical data, all of these studies, and they concluded there are four pathways for everyone to flourish. Whether you're married, with kids, not kids, or single, these are the four pathways. Family, that you were born into a family, connect to a family. We've talked about the power of family that has so much power in our lives for good, to build us up, set us up, cause flourishing. Or part of many people's story is the detriment to family and how discouraging it was, how harmful it is. And we're trying to still recover from family because of how powerful it can be. But a good family is part of human flourishing. And they said work and education. Work not so much about necessarily your employment, but work that gives you purpose and meaning. Where it gives you identity and value, meaningful work that you contribute in a community. And he speaks about education. Not that more education means more flourishing, but it's the attitude of really being a lifelong learner. Someone who is always growing in their understanding of how relationships work, how the world works, how sciences work. And with understanding comes more flourishing. And number four is so fascinating that they highlighted one of the four pathways to human flourishing is religious community. 
They looked at all of those who were flourishing and said, the people who flourish the most aren't simply connected to, but they belong in a religious community. And they saw the health benefits of mental health, physical health, emotional health, relational health, really off the charts of those who participated in religious community. And one of the questions was, is religious community just simply associated with people who are healthy? Or is it a cause? Like, does it actually cause people to become healthy, to be healthy? That was the big question. Is it an association or a causation? Association would be Christians go to church, Christians eat ice cream. Is that an association or causation? Does going to church make you want to eat ice cream? So the question is about our flourishing, association or causation. And they looked at all the empirical data and they realized it was causation not merely association. And they realized this because the root issue of the flourishing was your attendance in an incarnational community. So that when you breathe the same air, when you see people face to face, when you're in the room together, when you're speaking to one another, was the cause of flourishment. Meaning, and this is where they discovered it, if you have personal private faith, and it's very individualistic, you're maybe connected to a religious community, maybe you watch its services online, but you don't see the people, they didn't actually have the same health benefits. The health benefits were directly associated to those who gathered regularly regularly in community. In fact, they were compounding. For those who attended weekly services, they saw great health benefits. But for those who attended bi-weekly community events, meaning maybe you gather on Sunday and then you regather in like a women's group, a men's group, a Bible study, they showed compounding percentage of flourishing. You can read the whole story if you want to Google it. Now the question that they're asking is, why? How is that possible that gathering together in this community we call faith so beneficial to us? Why is it that we're so much healthier? Why do we seem so much more flourishing in this community? And the reduction of people who would say they're isolated or alone. Now, I have a really easy answer for that. It's exactly what we've been going through. Is that God has called us to love one another like Christ has loved us. In fact, this would be our distinct attribute. If the world looked at us as Christians and said, Man, look at how well they're doing in their relationships. What is that? We say, oh, it's, it's, it's Christ. We've dressed ourselves in Christ. And this is our attitude towards one another because it's hard to be in relationship with one another. And so Jesus has set the model and example of how we do community in the ways he loved us. And we're simply reflecting that to one another. And so I want to I go to a passage that's often not preached on. It's going to be the end of Colossians. And because the reason I want to go there is because I think we even have a mental picture of Paul that's wrong. We have an American spirit, and the the definition of the American spirit is independence. We want to be really independent from one another. We love the superhero who's like the Lone Ranger, the Batman, who's doing it all by himself, and we really want to be that. And in some ways, we have imagined people like Paul being this Lone Ranger superhero Christian where it's like Paul and Jesus and nobody else and he's good to go. Like the Apostle Paul, he like gets on his steed, he rides into town, he starts a church, a community, and then he's off to another city or town. But what we find at the end of Colossians is actually that Paul is not isolated and alone. This independent Lone Ranger, him plus Jesus and no one else, but that he's intimately connected in a community, talking to a community. And so what I want to do is go to Colossians here. We're going to be at the end in in chapter 4. And on your way, it's good to be reminded that the ways in which Paul said, okay, community, dress yourself in Christ, that we would flourish together, that we'd be built up together, is to really take off all of the self-focused, self-interested ways in which we try to dress, and dress yourself in Christ's compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearings with one another, supporting one another, helping one another. This is forgiving one another because you're going to offend each other. And then put on love, 
which binds all of this together. And at the end of Colossians, after speaking about that, he's really going to show how the community he belongs to has practiced that. And this is the root, the reason why they flourish. So let's go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. If you are looking for baby names that have not been used in a while, this is your text. All right. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read amongst you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from, the La from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And so what we see immediately at the end, in, in a list of names that often is like, well, why would you preach out of a text like that? It's just people that he knows. No, it debunks this idea of the Apostle Paul, solo, lone ranger, independent, to seeing him intimately connected in community. He's not the Apostle. He is one of many in a community, supporting and working together, gathering together in an incarnational way that produces human flourishing. And so there are many attributes of this community that we want to highlight. But first and foremost, we have to say this community is not some utopian community where everyone's perfectly getting along. Just a bunch of milk toast people. What do you need? Oh, you go first. We have no problems here, no disagreements. No, in fact, part of this community is hardship in relationship in which they actively have to put on Christ so that they can flourish. So if a few names just to mention off the top. Onesimus. Onesimus, you remember from the letter of Philemon. Onesimus left his master. He's a servant. And he flees. And Paul meets him and he comes to know Christ. And Paul disciples him and says, Onesimus, you have to go be reconciled. But here's the thing, I want you to be reconciled, not as a servant back to Philemon. I want, I want to see your liberation. I want to see your freedom. And so I'm going to advocate for you. And so he sends a letter with Onesimus to Philemon and says, Philemon, receive him back, not as a servant, but as a brother in Christ. If he's hurt you, offended you, if he owes you anything, put it on my tab. I'll pay it. I'll reimburse you. I want to make sure that we are in community together. And so he reconciles this relationship. I think of another mention here is, is Mark. Mark was connected to Barnabas. If you remember in Acts, in one of uh, Paul's missionary journeys, there's this big disagreement that comes between Paul and Barnabas because of Mark. And there's a fallout. And they actually separate and go different ways. This is Acts chapter 15, verse 36. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Let's go check on them. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. 
But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and he departed. And so there's this fallout in community. Can you imagine? Christians together having a disagreement? Never! And they do. And the relationships are fractured. Now what's so interesting is Acts, we're talking about the missionary journeys of Paul, those happened in the late 40s, so late 40s to probably the mid to late 50s is when that disagreement's going to happen. Colossians is written in the early 60s, meaning Paul has done what he's called the church to do, dress himself like Christ and to forgive one another as Christ forgave him. What you're seeing is that Paul has reconciled with Mark and Barnabas. He says if, if Mark comes, welcome him. Not beat him up, kick him out. Welcome him. I, I have reconciled with him. I have forgiven him. He has forgiven me. We are back in right relationship. Because they have clothed themselves in the love of Christ. But not everyone stays together. And there's just the reality of hardship. There, there, are, there are friends that we have in the faith that will depart. That want nothing to do with Jesus later. And that was Demas. Demas is mentioned here in Colossae as a fellow worker, a servant with Paul. But in a later letter to Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, this is chapter 4, Verse 9, he tells Timothy, do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Like he, Demas was with us. We've mentioned him in previous letters. But his love and concerns, cares for this present world, he has departed us and left. That's hard. That's a hard reality in community. And so there are other attributes, characteristics of those mentioned here in Colossians that talk about what is it that binds the community? How does the community recover from that? How does the community continue to care for one another? Well, we look at these attributes back in Colossians. First, of Tychicus. Tychicus comes with Onesimus. And he's going to tell you of all the things that have happened. This is why we encourage you to share your lives, the good the bad and the ugly, all the things that are happening with one another in your life group so that you can encourage one another, that your, your success has encouraged me, your faith encourages me, how you overcome and go through trials encourage me. When we have missionaries all around the world come to Calvary on their homestay and they share with us what God has been up to in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, what God has been up to in China, what he's doing in Tanzania, what he's doing all around the world. We are encouraged, are we not? To hear of their faith. This is what these two come to do for the church. They're encouragers to the church. I love it. It says, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. That they're going to encourage your hearts. Are you an encourager? I'll tell you, when, when you have someone who is bitter and resentful in the family of God, who's always negative, they're so divisive. But an encourager who steps in and says, this is what I see God doing. You're doing well. Continue it. Encourage means to give courage. That the Christian faith is long and oftentimes can be hard and difficult. But an encourager comes and gives you courage to face tomorrow's challenges. Do you have someone in your life that's an encourager? It's like a cheerleader, champion of you. That's what these guys are. Then we go into uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. So Paul in chains says that I have someone with me in my sorrow. I have someone physically with me, present with me in my grief. He's a prisoner. This work actually be prisoner of war. That, that Paul is contending for something. He's battling for something. He's actually mentioned in the letter of Philemon as a fellow soldier. So that would make sense that he's been contending with Paul. He's been battling with Paul. Do you have a, a brother or a sister 
that knows what's going on in your life, knows the challenges, and you are locked up arm in arm with addressing the challenges together. That's what Paul has. Paul is not isolated and alone. In fact, this, pr- this fellow prisoner goes on to mention Mark and Barnabas and this one who's named Justice. These are the only Jewish people, those who were Jewish and then saw Jesus as the promised Messiah, who are with me. And Paul says, this community of people, they're not below me. They don't serve me. They're not just simply my employees that I disperse. What does he say about them? They have been a comfort to me. What does it look like to be comforted? It means someone comes into your grief and sorrow and brings you cheer. It's someone who shoulders sorrows with you. This is what Paul says that this community is to him. They are well acquainted with his life. And there are those who are with him that are a great comfort, that cheer his soul, that sit with him in his sorrow, that encourage his heart. And he's sending them to the church to do the same for them. And then he moves from those that were part of the Jewish faith who believed in Christ, but now are Gentiles who embrace Christ, the Hellenistic community that loves Jesus. And he begins with this man named Epaphras, who is one of you. He's from Colossae. Epaphras was the one who actually preached the good news, and the church began in response to what he preached. Epaphras is the one that, that, that sent word to Paul and said, Paul, I preached the gospel in Colossae, and there's a bunch of people that are Christians that have accepted Christ, that have repented of their sins, that have turned from their idols, that are worshipers. And so Epaphras is sent, and here's what's said about Epaphras, this is so good. Who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. He's a prayer warrior. The success and flourishing of this community is because someone like Epaphras is saturated in prayer. I love what Tom Wright says, prayer is not some sort of ancillary activity to teaching and preaching, other works of ministry. Prayer is the work of ministry. It is the work of ministry. It's what produces in us, as we see, a maturity and confidence. Look what he says, on behalf of his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. How is it that we mature in Christ? It is through prayer. How is it that we grow more confident in Christ? To know what Christ wants from us or is directing us to do. It is through prayer. Here at Calvary, we want to be a praying church. We want that to be part of our DNA. This is why every service ends with an invitation for you to come and pray. Not because it's an ancillary activity to what just happened, but because it is the work of ministry. It's where we see the power of God moving to mature believers and cause them to be steadfast. To be certain of what God is doing in their life. This is where the community at Calvary has prayed over the years. When we gathered to pray about moving out into Erie. When we prayed that, Lord, you would provide land to us. When we prayed a couple years ago, Lord, on our hearts is a a sense to help those who are driving from the south of us. That they would run into a church like Calvary. and, And a church was given to us. Just gifted. So that we would be able to share the gospel ministry in Thornton. This is what happens from prayer. This year is 50 years in which we celebrate a men's group that Doug Palmer started 50 years ago on the Boulder campus. And every Thursday for the last 50 years, these men have gathered to pray for the elders and pastors, the congregation, and Calvary Bible Church. 50 years, every Thursday. These are men like Epaphras, prayer warriors. I think of in our own congregation, people like Ruby Sharp, who is devoted to prayer, for she knows it is the work of the Lord. I think of our prayer team led by the Jacks. I think of others who are devoted to prayer, just like Epaphras, so that we would be mature and know what God's will is for us. And then he moves on, mentioning Luke, who is his scribe, who has followed him everywhere. He's the historian, telling the stories of what God has done through the church. He mentions again, or mention, again he mentions Demas, who is later going to depart. 
And then he mentions this beautiful woman, Nympha, who opened her house for the church to meet there. That she, through her hospitality and generosity of using what the Lord has given her, is building up this community that flourishes. And I just think of all the women that opened up their houses recently for, for table gatherings to welcome other women around their table so that they would be brought not just connected to, but brought into community. I think of the ways in which many people here at Calvary open their homes so that we gather together throughout the week. I think back to COVID. I think of when we, just, when we chose to suspend our large group gatherings, not to cancel church, but to suspend our la- large group gatherings and gather in hundreds of homes around the front range. And now hundreds of people opened up their house so the church would continue to meet together, so that we would not give up meeting together, so that we can continue to meet and encourage one another, pray together, b- share each other's burdens, support and comfort one another without missing a beat. Many of you opened your homes. You have this character of nympha to be hospitable. And it's hard because you're opening your homes and then you're opening your pantries and then you're opening your fridge and people are eating your food and, and then needy people show up and you give out of what the Lord has given you. This is another characteristic of a community that gathers and flourishes because there are women like nympha. And then he concludes with Archippus. And I love that he says to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. There's something that the Lord has so impressed on his heart. Maybe he has grown weary. Maybe he's gotten discouraged. I don't know. Maybe he's gotten distracted. And Paul just says, I want you to remember what the Lord has shaped you to be. What he has laid on your heart, I need you to, I need you to finish that work. And that's what I would say here at Calvary is every single person in this room is uniquely shaped, gifted, wired for the work of ministry. We are the ministers. The paid staff are not the the ministers of Calvary Bible Church. We simply desire to empower the ministers, to resource the ministers for the work of ministry. And so the Lord has laid on each of us a work to do. And maybe some of you have grown weary, distracted, disheartened, and this is just a call back to say, finish the work. Restart that work. What has God called you, been pressed on your heart as ministers of the gospel to finish, to continue? For every person in the body matters. You matter. We need you to express your giftings, your heart, your passions here with us. And so it's a call for him to continue this. And then Paul just simply ends with, I write this with my own hand. This is my heart to you. From my community to your community, in community, we grow in Christ. And so this would be my question to you. If Paul was to write Calvary Bible Church, where would your name show up? Where would your name show up here and what would the characteristic be of you? It's like, oh, Dan, just pray like Dan. Encourage like Bo. Pray like Ruby. Open your house like Dolores. Be hospitable to one another. Look how they comfort one another. Sit with each other. Where would your name show up? Because the reason faith community causes flourishing is because we are an incarnational community dressed in Christ's attributes. Loving one another as Christ loved us. And it doesn't work simply to be online, to stop in once in a while. Your flourishment, as God designed you to be, is not simply to be connected to the family of God, but to be engaged in the family of God. And so this is just a, just a call to all of us. Say, if you feel isolated and alone, If you feel like life is very challenging and you are having to shoulder everything by yourself, this is a reminder that your flourishment is found in our flourishment. Is that you belong with us in the family of God. Christianity is not an independent activity that you do by yourself. 
It is something that we are doing together as we pursue Jesus Christ and are being transformed. And so the reason the church causes flourishment is because this is the place in which we are built up in Christ. This is where God meets with us. This is where the Holy Spirit transforms us and shapes us. This is where in which we forgive one another. We express encouragement to one another. We're kind to one another. We express comforts to one another and build one another up in love that binds all of this together. And so the question for your own flourishment is, is there another step you need to take to engage in the community of believers? If you've been away for a while, you've been outside the community, can you just indicate maybe on that Connect card or maybe online sometime this week, I've been on the periphery and I see the need because even the Apostle Paul was engaged in the community of faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have not asked us to do this by ourselves. That you have not called us to be lone rangers. But that you have called us together. And so, Father, I ask that you would be especially gracious to us here at Calvary. That we would clothe ourselves in Christ. That we would be like Paul to reconcile brothers and sisters together. We'd be peacemakers. Help us to extend forgiveness to those that have wounded us or hurt us in community. So that we would continue to flourish. And Father, I just pray for anyone in this room who has been resistant to being known and belonging. I pray that the gentleness of the Spirit would convict them to come in. And that they would find a place to express their own gifting, the ways in which you have wired them for our good. In the mighty name of Jesus, King Jesus, the head of this church, we pray. Amen.